All right. So I have the great privilege to uh, moderate this important session Ahmed. that is going to be emphasizing very practical matters, taking it from the global perspective first, based on a very important report that is being launched now as we speak, one led by uh, Professor Nexter and my good sister, distinguished economist and development activist, they have climate as well now, I have to, they are um, So perhaps we can start by you both who uh, uh, let us know um, uh, the main findings of this report. And directly after that, I'll be asking uh, President um, Abyssina to give us some reflections on uh, the report or the presentation by Nick and Vera. And then uh, we will get the perspective from the UNDP and by uh, my good friend, uh, the very distinguished leader of the UNDP, Patrick Steiner. And then we will have the uh, work from the private sector by Ms. Rafa. Then the, uh, the co-leader, representative of this important work on uh, uh, asking you Nick and Vera to do this work on behalf of His Excellency the President of uh, uh, the uh, the veteran ambassador. When it comes to climate, it's very young to be a veteran, but by experience and involvement and the work that he's doing um, uh, that we all know about, but there, are, there is more that we don't know about when he is very much involved behind the scenes for the good. Because some of the, the work behind the scenes could be uh, in doubt, but he's always behind the good outcomes for the greater market. So, without further ado, let me normally say in this uh, context, ask Nick and then Vera to let us know what we should know from this very important report that you work with your, your team. Some of them are here. My good friend, Marta Tachari, uh, 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 is here as well. So, please, uh, Professor. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, we're dividing it into Vera and myself. I will talk about the climate pilots. Can you hear me in the back there? Yes, no, can. No, no. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right. This work was uh, commissioned or requested by the two COP uh, presidencies, COP26, COP27. We're very grateful. And with the uh, direct in involvement and, uh, uh, of uh, Mahmoud and Nigel, the two climate champions. Thank you very much for that. And the Amar Bhattacharya, who's executive secretary and led the writing of this uh, report. So finance for what? Finance for delivery on Paris. It's his delivery implementation. And uh, that means uh, climate uh, finance, but climate finance for development. It's absolutely critical that this is finance for the development story of the 21st century, which is the drive to net zero and all the creativity and efficiency and innovation and better health that's involved in that growth story. So within that big picture of climate and development and the sustainable growth story, what are the key elements? So it's finance for a purpose. These are the key elements, which are the key elements of delivery on Paris. The first block is the energy transition. The second block is loss and damage, adaptation, resilience. And the third block is the natural capital. The first block, and here anybody who's looked at these numbers comes to the same conclusions, the first and the bigger, bigger part of the investment story is the energy transition takes different forms in different places. But uh, for that, we're talking about something close to $1.4 trillion a year. In emerging markets and developing economies, excluding uh, China, um, by 2030. So that's the 2030 flow for that part of the story, around $1.4 uh, One trillion for the remainder. And you can think of... Um, you can think of loss and damage, uh, adaptation and resilience, and natural capital. Those three elements of the one trillion may be around a third. 
in the nature of things, we cannot be too precise here, but in terms of orders of magnitude, think of about a third for those three elements. As soon as we've said that, it's very clear that you need very different forms of finance for these different elements. Finance for natural capital, finance for loss and damage doesn't look the same as finance for electricity generation as part of the um, uh, energy transition. That, of course, we would hope would be uh, quite a big element, perhaps mostly private sector, but for the natural capital and loss and damage, rather less so. So it's very important, different forms of finance for the different parts of this uh, story. So that's the challenge. Delivery on Paris, delivery on the growth story of the 21st century. These are the big areas. So we've spoken about the investment for which the finance is required. And then the last point I want to make before I hand over to, Zero, to, to Vera for what that finance looks like is that in that 2.4 um, in, in that in, in that 2.4 trillion emerging markets developing economies of investment, you'd expect a big chunk of that to be financed internally. Most investment in most countries is uh, financed internally. Different countries in that group of emerging markets and developing economies outside China will have different capabilities. There are some which will be pushed to finance very much internally. There'll be other countries which can dif are in a position to finance a lot internally. Uh, so if you take that 2.4 trillion, perhaps uh, uh, you know, the, uh, a bit over half of that internally financed, you come external flow of external finance of around a trillion. Yeah? So that's the story, how we get to a trillion of external finance insisting that this has very different parts to it. It's not one pot. It's uh, not negotiated. It's a logical deduction from what we need to do to deliver on Paris. I was there for the 100 billion negotiation in uh, 2009. I understand how it happened. Uh, it was a negotiated number, warts and all. Delivery on that fundamental, a matter of trust. But this is, this, that should happen, should have happened before now, happen next year. This is a different story. How do you finance the investment that we need to deliver on Paris? And for the different bits, let me hand over to Vera. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Nick. Uh, let me start, first of all, by uh, thanking Mahmoud. Of course, uh, 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 the COP presidency of the UK, Alok Sharma, the Minister Shukri, uh, and Nigel, who is not here with us today, uh, for uh, giving us the opportunity to, do, to write this report, uh, which is Finance for Climate Action. I think Nick has talked a little bit about the why, what is it that we're doing. We sort of, uh, as Amar would like to say, and Amar is here, who's been the Executive Secretary working with us on this, uh, uh, it's an engineering approach of saying, you know, why, why do we need the money? What, what for? And uh, Nick has talked about it. But then how do we break down the different kinds of financing that we need? Uh, because clearly, uh, as we said, and as, as Nick has, uh, just uh, said, this is no longer the 100 billion. We have done a scientific, uh, academic approach to say, what do we really need? And we've come out with a trillion dollars in external financing between now and 2030 uh, for everything that we need. What does that mean? It means first that we need to accelerate investment. Financing is great. But we know that actually some of the cost of financing is just the fact that it takes very long to do projects, right? I usually say that the longer it takes to do a project, the more expensive implicitly it will take. And the CEO of uh, Bank of America was saying, in America, it takes three months to do a 10 gigawatt project. It takes three years in uh, the developing world. That's costly, even for the staff that need to work on it. So policy is the most important part of financing. We need to get the policy environment right. It's not money, but it's policies. And policies are an expensive part of the financing story. So we must accelerate the investments. We must get country and regional platforms, particularly in geographies like Africa, where we have regional power pools, which is a big part of the financing we need. We must put the policy environment in place uh, to get that done. The second thing 
uh, of course, that we need to do is mobilize multilateral development bank financing. This is going to be the biggest block of financing that we need. It's not only mobilizing multilateral development bank financing and regional development bank financing, it's also using the financing in the right place, right? We don't need that financing at the end of the pipe. We need it to help prepare the projects, to help bring the partners together, essentially to come in almost to take the first loss guarantee. Uh, that's what we need it for, because later we'll talk about mobilizing private finance, where then we want equity to come in, we want some knowledge transfer to happen. But the multilateral development banks need to scale up substantially um, to make sure that we can actually deliver on what we want to deliver. What we also need, of course, is low cost, almost zero cost IDA type financing. And for that, we are looking, of course, at philanthropy and GIA, Rockefeller, Gates, and all that are doing a lot of that under the jet peas, uh, uh, as we have seen in Indonesia, Vietnam, and South Africa. But we also need a different kind of financing, which is the carbon markets. Yesterday, we launched uh, the African uh, Carbon Markets Initiative, but we're also working on that in Indonesia. I think uh, we're looking at trying to harmonize and standardize uh, carbon markets so that we can ensure that at least the prices are transparent, the monitoring is obvious and efficient, and one can do that. We are also looking at ODA. We need to make sure that there is enough ODA that is flowing through the system that can ensure, again, that for the lowest of countries, clearly with countries that are highly indebted, you cannot make them go back to the markets to do things uh, that are needed uh, to ensure, for example, on the part of loss and damage, that it works efficiently and it works well. Indebtedness is something that is important, and we keep talking about it. Every time, particularly if you come from the small island states, I was just talking to Jean-Paul, who is part of uh, the high-level panel, uh, and we've done a lot of work. He's been working on Cape Verde uh, with, for debt swaps on Capo Verde. We cannot ask a country that essentially has done everything it needs to do but gets hit by climate shock to go back to the markets and borrow at high market cost to deal with climate shocks. This is untenable. So we need to find ways of making sure, one, that we can reduce the cost of capital. Right. We're uh, talking about the liquidity and sustainability facility, but there are many more things that need, that can be done. So these are the five parts of the sort of types of financing. Investments, public policy, we call that financing as part of it. Managing indebtedness, low cost of capital, ensuring that the MDBs can do what they need to do, revamping concessional financing. Once we have all of that in place, we can bring in the private sector. I see Jay here at a scale of $1 to 10 maybe of private financing to get all of this done. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much, uh, Nick and Vera. Excellent introduction. And please, panelists, if you find me standing, this doesn't mean that I'm leaving the room. It's basically that you have 30 seconds to wrap up. Uh, uh, the president of the African Development Bank, President Adesina, as you have listened and you know about this important report, uh, the multilateral development banks in general, the African Development Bank in particular, are in the front of the implementation when it comes to finance, te technical assistance, capacity development, knowledge sharing, and the support when it comes to de-risking elements. So what is practical of what you just heard from Nick and Vera? Well, first, let me thank Nick and Vera for an excellent report that, that they have pursued, uh, produced. There's no doubt in my mind that the, the greatest challenge for climate change is actually in Africa. Um, you know, I was just listening to you when you were talking about the loss and damage. In fact, the estimates that we actually have at the African Development Bank shows that, in fact, Africa, if you were looking at how much the loss and damage is, should be, will actually need about 1.3 uh, to 1.6 uh, 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 trillion dollars uh, for climate adaptation between now and 2030. But when you look at the amount of carbon that has been emitted in the world and what Africa is suffering for in terms of compensation, in fact, Africa will probably need about 4.8 to about, yeah, about 4.8 trillion dollars by 2030. You walk the math, that comes at about 165 billion dollars a year that Africa needs to be compensated for because of the emissions of the developed countries. Well, how much is Africa actually getting? Well, Africa is only getting 18 billion dollars a year in climate finance. When it's adaptation, Africa is only getting 11 billion dollars a year. So when we look at it, the amount that Africa is actually owed, if I can say that, it's actually about almost 100 
and $10 billion a year. So the whole of the conversation we've been having about there's the need to pay up the $100 billion that's very ev evasive for everybody cannot even compensate Africa for actually what it is owed. Practically, what are we doing about that? First is that the African Development Bank, we launched a major program for adaptation, which is called the African Adaptation Acceleration Program to mobilize $25 billion for climate adaptation in Africa. We had an event just uh, yesterday. We were very delighted that the UK government provided $200 million towards that effort. The Netherlands provided another 110 million euros towards that. So we continue to do that. But numbers are always like that in the air. So what does it really mean for the ordinary person that's on the street? At the African Development Bank, we opened a new climate action window within the African Development Fund replenishment, which is the concessional arm of the bank's financing. That is to leverage up to about $13 billion, and it will allow 20 million farmers to have access to climate-resilient agricultural technologies, which they need to adapt to this climate change. It will allow 20 million farmers and pastoralists that are actually negatively affected to have weather index crop insurance and pastoralists to also have insurance. You're going to also have a million hectares of land that is degraded that we have to rejuvenate, but also to have almost 840 billion cubic meters of water for 18 million people. So that's practically what we are trying uh, uh, to do with that. Now, two points I want to make, uh, which, because Vera and Nick were talking about the importance of multilateral institutions. I think the global financial architecture has to do a better job of actually mobilizing the financing uh, here. Here, I really think, first is we as multilateral development banks need to actually optimize our balance sheets better. Yeah. And the African Development Bank is leading on it. We've done a lot of synthetic securitization. We just did one just a, a month ago where we freed up $2 billion uh, headroom for ourselves by transferring some of our uh, non-sovereign assets, uh, sovereign assets to the private sector. We need to do that. That was guaranteed for us by the UK, UK government. Vera mentioned the issue of SDRs when she was talking, and I think the SDRs could play a big role. You know, here the SDRs, if you actually provide it to the multilateral development banks, in addition to IMF, what will it do? At the African Development Bank, you know, we, we can leverage that four times, right? So $10 billion become $40 billion that we can use to capitalize African institutions to do water, sanitation, energy, infrastructure, and all the things that we do, we do need. So we do think that the SDRs are critical, but it needs to go beyond just becoming a reserve asset just for central banks. And the last thing that I wanted to, uh, uh, to say uh, on this particular issue is the role of investors. We have in Africa today $2.1 trillion of assets under management. Globally, we have $103 trillion, or $130 trillion of assets under management. If you can just get 0.04% of that, and move that to finance infrastructure in Africa that is climate resilient, I think we'll be able to mobilize a lot of resources to close the kind of gap that we are hearing here. The, it's not just about development financing. Sometimes I worry about the, what is being promised. Um, it's almost like megawatts of talk sometimes uh, that doesn't really lead to financing uh, on the table, but clearly the private sector is the way to go. We just have to de-risk their investment and mobilize that capital. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, President Adesina, for um, these remarks. You mentioned um, many important things, but I'd like to pick two of them for possible follow-up by the rest of the panelists. One is the role of the private sector, especially in adaptation and what we can do. You mentioned the 11 billion plus to Africa, but the share of the private sector is around 3%. Globally, is around 2%. And when we uh, checked deeper, the private sector is coming from uh, the form of foundations and philanthropies. So not our typical definition um, of private sector unless you stretch it a bit. So what can we do better in doing that? This is very relevant as well to Ambassador Walo Belmag, given the importance of the Sharm el-Sheikh climate agenda uh, with the specific areas of work. And again, this is an area of, uh, of finance that you need perhaps to share your expectations on this. A great deal of capacity development, getting the global initiatives into local um, uh, level. There is no better than Mr. Achim Steiner to share with us views on this uh, uh, matter from a practical perspective again. 
Thank you, Mahmoud. Um, distinguished panelists, let me first of all confess that I've not yet had an opportunity to look at the detailed numbers in uh, the report that Nick and Vera just presented, but I want to begin with one phenomenon that I see in this public perception. News headlines that come out of Sharm el-Sheikh will shape 99% of the world's perception of what we are discussing here. So let's begin, first of all, with the magnitude. When we aggregate these figures, they sound extraordinarily high. But when you put them in context and when you begin to disaggregate them again, as you have done in, in constructing them, what, what is one or two trillion in the larger context of a financial system? It's probably somewhere around one, maybe two percent of global wealth. So, first of all, this is not a figure that should make us feel like this is without precedent, this is impossible, this is beyond the reach of financial markets, of investors. It is a very high figure, but it should never be understood as a figure, as I understand, Nick and Vera, what you have said, that we are talking here about a direct taxpayer's transfer from one country to another. Not at all. We're talking about a complex and intermediated financial system of markets, public finance, private finance, delivering the kinds of investments. Secondly, and I don't know, Nick, I was looking, and it's actually surprisingly difficult to get a reliable number, on what was the total investment in renewable energies last year. Um, when you look at it, the figures range from 300 to 500 to 600 to 700 billion dollars worldwide in one year. I don't know where you come down on that figure, but that just gives you another idea. And this is not capturing the totality of it, it is an estimate. So I think let us first of all embrace the fact that we are in a period of major transformation. And therefore, the kind of orders of magnitude we are talking about here are both rational, they are also not out of this world and being able to deal with it. The second part that I think is very important when we talk about these figures is something that I believe we still continue to underestimate in terms of its value, but also in terms of how we design investment pathways. Um, in another event earlier on, I spoke to the fact that in UNDP, we can design a project that is almost identical and call it an SDG 7 project about access to electricity or access to clean electricity, as would be a project that essentially comes through the window of the Sustainable Development Goal on Climate Change, SDG 13. These are not parallel universes. These are the same people in the same locality dealing with the same markets in which they have to actually figure out how to finance investment in access to electricity. Add to that job creation, add to that poverty reduction, and I could go on. There are ways in which these one or two trillion dollars could actually generate multiple benefits. The cost-benefit assessment frameworks need to change. Final point, let's also recognize that in putting these global figures forward, we then have this extremely variable reality of countries being able to access finance. Vera, you spoke to it as well. I think here we have to, in the short term, first of all, deal with the debt problem. You cannot ask countries to borrow more. And let's be honest, much of what we're talking about here, even in the current climate finance, is actually the taxpayers of developing countries borrowing at concessional terms the money in order to deliver on a collective outcome, namely the energy transition. It's extremely expensive, and many countries are now at a point of debt distress. So unless we deal with the short-term debt problem, many countries will not be part of that one to two trillion dollar figure or economy. Secondly, let's also deal with the cost of borrowing. I think it is high time that we looked at, particularly for the African continent, and Akin, you know much more about this than I do, of how the risk of investors is priced. Africa is beholden to a few entities operating at the global level with a very narrow set of parameters, pricing risk of borrowing from an African perspective in the global financial markets. I think with much of what um, we can bring to the cost of risk finance and also the actuarial science that today allows us to recalibrate that cost, we may bring down the cost of borrowing significantly, which would fundamentally change the equation for many African countries to be part of that $2.4 trillion economy. That's much of the work we do in UNDP, and I can see by Mahmoud's raised eyebrow that I don't have time to talk about this, but come and have a look at UNDP.org, our work on um, SDG impact, on climate finance, and also on investors' maps, and um, there are many practical solutions that we are proud to work with countries and our partners here. Thank you. Excellent comments, and I think this report dealt with this false dichotomy between climate finance and development finance, and it's within 
the framework of funding, climate can support development finance and vice versa, but if articulated better through policy frameworks and institutional support. You mentioned the private sector and you mentioned that countries are already indebted, but we need to see how that will change going forward and what can the private sector can do better in providing funding long term and with more private equity participation. This gets me into Ms. Pfeiffer and what she has to share with us. Thank you. Yeah. Many thanks um, for being here. And um, we run a membership organization for investors with 400 pension funds, mainly based in Europe. And okay. couldn't agree all, all more the with the panel that mobilizing finance at scale for emerging and developing countries is absolutely critical. And without that, we, the 1.5 degree goal is, is not going to happen. Um, we've heard a lot of numbers from Nick in, in terms of what is also an investment opportunity. The funding gap is, is huge. I think the OECD estimated it at 4.2 trillion by 2030, and that's before the events we've had this year alone. The IA says that we need $1 trillion of investment every year in emerging markets in clean energy alone. So that is really the growth story, as the, the report think, uh, has said, of, of this century. And so investors are interested, there is willingness, there is appetite to, to move in this direction. Um, we've seen that, unfortunately, only in small pockets so far, um, but there are some projects where infrastructure financing and so on, where we have some good examples of, of action being taken. Of course, those flows are far too small for now to fix, fix that funding gap. Why is that? Is that? Because of the risk tolerance of investors, the country risk, of course, we all know about that. But they are bound by a fiduciary duty, which does make it more difficult to invest in particularly in developing countries, but also in emerging markets. Um, so let me give you four points where I think we can, we can make some progress. This is what our members tell me are the most important things. First of all, strong policy is, is vital. We need the one and a half degree aligned NDCs, but they need to be underpinned by strong policy, uh, pricing signals, carbon pricing, f phase out of fossil fuels as well, uh, subsidies in a just way, and then the underlying policies that you need for that. The second is that we do need risk-bearing instruments and blended finance, but that needs to happen at scale. And great to see um, the, co the comments from Nick in terms of the kind of capital you need for different types of risk that need to be reduced. And also some of it, not all of it is catalytic, of course. Some of it has to be concessional grant funding to, to scale up those projects, but some of it needs, or more of it needs to be catalytic to really attract uh, private finance at scale. So I think our members do welcome the discussions we're not having about some of the reforms of the MDBs and how, how that capital ca can be used in the right way so that the investments can be de-risked. The third point I want to make is these markets are new to many investors. They're all very different. And, and our members don't always have the internal capacity to really understand what the project pipelines are, what the risks are. And so it's, it's really important that as much data as possible is shared. I know the Asset Owner Alliance and others, a Canadian pension fund yesterday, have asked for the data to be shared so that they know what projects have worked and what haven't, hasn't worked, because that also helps to, to reduce the risk. We've asked the IA to explain the technology pathways in different regions as well. All that provides investors with, with much more insight on where they can invest their money. And finally, local knowledge partnerships are really, really important with project developers, with DFIs, with MDBs, because that helps to, to scale up the internal capacity at our members as well. So my final point is just if we get the whole system working together, I think we can make a, a lot more progress. Right. Thank you so much. Um, Ambassador Royal, I will back as a gracious host. I hope that you don't mind if President Adesina just say a couple of words before he goes to chair a, a session, and then we'll ask you to do two things. Uh, give overall reflections on this segment, and then get us starting on why the regional work, building the pipeline, was important, and why the Egyptian presidency supported this work. President Adesina, you have a few seconds. Uh, 
uh, sorry, we, we're launching the, <coughs> the Alliance for Green Infrastructure in a few minutes, and I have to chair it, so sorry to be uh, disruptive in the I just wanted to make two points. One is to support what Ajkim was saying about the issue of concessional financing. Um, this is especially important for the low-income and fragile states that do not have this private sector in which you can mobilize a lot of capital. And for them, concessional financing is vital. Even for the multilateral development bank, our total amount of climate finance this, uh, last year was about $55 billion. But 95% of that was actually in loans. Only 5% of that was actually in concessional financing. So we actually do need to expand concessional financing. And I think that's why the um, African Development Bank replenishment this year is very important for those countries. And the second point I want to make is please let's also look at the carbon markets. Uh, because we, we, if you look at the carbon markets, Africa's share of carbon markets, it's what, 0.4% of that? And it's about $633 billion a year. So we do need to price carbon properly. We have to develop our local carbon markets and do green infrastructure so we can actually get green bonds and also all manner of green financing to Africa to close a lot of this gap. So thank you very much uh, to both of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And yesterday we launched the uh, Carbon uh, Market Initiative for Africa with the presence of four presidents from the continent, and we hope to have the partnership for, from the African Development Bank and through you all attending. So, Ambassador Wairabul Mag, the floor is yours. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mohideen. Um, I'll go straight to the point. As any incoming presidency is, is going to be aware, the main responsibility is to push the needle on every aspect of the work. Climate finance, the global climate finance landscape, as anyone in this room probably knows, leaves much to be desired. Uh, we are very keenly aware of that, and we have the negotiating side, which is the property of the, of the countries, the party-driven process, and they have to take care of that. So we have to look creatively at opportunities, how we can make a contribution to push the landscape forward. But we cannot do this without taking a more scrutinizing look at the current state of global climate finance. I won't go to in, into too many details, but it leaves much to be desired with regard to access, with regard to efficiency, with regard to effectiveness of disbursement, of fairness and humanity, it denies money going to adaptation, which is the prime need for developing countries. It is heavily tilted towards mitigation action. It is, um, leaves a lot to be desired, and I don't want to take too much time just establishing something that is well-founded, and all the facts and figures and statistics out there show the amount of concessionality available, which is insufficient, the debt problem that this current setup creates, and the availability of grants at uh, the scale of about 6% of global climate finance only in grant form. So all of these things are structural and they are unjust, but most fundamentally, and nobody notices this and mentions it, mentions it enough, the very foundation of the entire climate change effort globally is based on a grand bargain. This grand bargain is developing countries did not create this situation but they need to be part of the solution. So part of the solution requires support coming to them. This is forgotten and we're in an era where we're all supposed to be fending for ourselves as developing countries and finding our own finance at a cost of debt. And uh, Dr. Steiner referred to this issue, the debt issue, the cost of borrowing on the markets is quadruple or multiples of what it is for comparing Switzerland to South Africa or a Nordic country to another Sub-Saharan African country or Latin American Asian country. So these are injustices and they're not just a matter of humanity and justice. They are a matter of practicality. This is a fragile regime that is being developed and created. If you squeeze countries into having to prioritize climate action, which they want to willingly do as a contribution over the very survival of their populations or their legitimate pursuit of eliminating poverty and having sustainable development in their midst, then the regime itself is threatened. Um, we have uh, multiple ideas to move forward on this issue, but I don't have time to address all of that. I'll just touch on a couple of points. MDBs are central to this process. Uh, I wish uh, President Adesino was still here, but there is a lot that they need to do to shift from a mindset prior to the climate emergency being this existential threat to our entire species and its existence on this planet. There's a role for philanthropies, and I always make this call to them. In the United States, 2% of total giving is going to climate. 
98% is not going to climate. But also, they need to be looking at areas that are starved of funding, not replicating investment. Lastly, in this regard, the issue of private. Private money is important. Private money, no one has any delusion or illusion that public money is going to be sufficient to address the crisis. But at the end of the day, it has to realize that private money is going to be very reluctant to go to adaptation and loss and damage because the business model doesn't exist. I'll wrap up in one second because I have to give credit to the hard work done by the, two, of course, by the report, which is central that we're proud to have uh, looked at and worked with the team for producing Dr. Stern, Dr. Sungwe. Um, we had a round table discussing it on October 24th in Cairo, and that was very beneficial to give you insights from multiple stakeholders. And we will look forward to working on the report, making sure it evolves as we move forward. Lastly, we had some effort by the presidency contributing to the global champions, uh, the high level champions in the five round tables that were organized within the economic commissions of the United Nations in five parts of the world. And I think those products will give us an indication of where bankable projects are going to be available and where bankable projects are simply not going to be available. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Excellent. So you mentioned the regional round table, you mentioned the pipeline of projects which is mentioned as well in the report that the private sector investors are expecting that ecosystem that Stephanie mentioned, but they need as well a decent pipeline of bankable or rather investable projects. And for that, we worked hard under your leadership with the champions, with the regional economic commissions and the whole UN system with the BCG investment banks. So we have a few minutes remaining the uh, next session with Kristalina and the Minister of Finance are waiting outside. So I'll make something unusual a bit, not planned. So I'll ask Sagarika to take the floor for one minute to mention the effort, the results, and how to get the compendium of the projects and what you are expecting from you. Vera was with us in her former capacity as the chief for the Regional Economic Commission. So we'd say that, and then I'd ask the rest of the panelists to give a few seconds reflection on how to get that forward pipeline within a context, policy frameworks for climate and development. Sagarika. Thank you very much, Dr. Mohuddin. Um, my name is Sagarika. I work for Dr. Mohuddin. Um, we're really delighted that over the um, last few months, we've been holding a series of um, forums, and these have resulted in a compendium that you can find online um, on the Champions website, and it covers 128 projects that represent the start, the potential for financing opportunities and a project pipeline. In total, this would require financing of 128 billion. We didn't actually plan these numbers to match, but as it happened, they did. So 128 projects, 128 billion from around the world, crossing across mitigation and adaptation. We've also released a short report, Assets to Flows, that covers some of the findings that really complements um, this very important report, which is more on the bigger picture, what needs to happen. We have an event later today, the COP27 special event, 2.30 p.m. in Action Room 1. We'd love you to come so we can go deeper. And our sincere thanks to Vera, who at her time um, in her previous role, kindly hosted um, one of our forums in Africa, which uncovered about 19 projects that do need financing. Thank you. Right. So we do need financing. Vera, you were happy with this initiative when you were an executive uh, secretary leading the Regional Economic Commission, are you still happy with the approach, given oh. that you are more free to, to say what you like now? No, you I, was free then, I was but always you are free, even more yes. free now. especially on the... No, thank you. I think the important thing uh, uh, on the projects, uh, uh, and again, the team is here, uh, is really that uh, we heard from uh, uh, Stephanie about what the private sector is looking for. I think we know what the public sector can offer. These are the projects. Now I think what we need to do is to sit down and say, you know, in many of these cases, the policy environment is right, right? One of the things that we... So, batteries are not matching the energy. Yeah. That's why we need to invest in DRC battery processing factories so we can do more. So because the other part of the climate conversation is actually uh, managing uh, storage. 
But going back to the projects, I think really that the developing world now has a pipeline of projects. We heard yesterday from the Prime Minister of Egypt that there's 10 gigawatts of a project that is already ready. The policy environment in Egypt, I think we all know, is ready and ripe. In many countries, Senegal, the minister was here, Ghana. I think what we now need to do is break down what does it mean, what are you looking for? Is it cost-reflective prices? Or is it a utility that is functioning? I think we need to go down into slightly right. more detail on that conversation. But the good thing about Africa is also the regional platforms, which we talk about in the report. I want to emphasize that. Because sometimes to get scale, you need to bring together, cluster the projects. We have mangrove projects in East Africa at scale. We have powerful projects on energy at scale. So I'm very happy with what we came out of. We have voluntary carbon markets projects because we have the pitlands of the Congo Basin. So we have, I think, on offering a little bit of everything that you're looking for, something on biodiversity. Right. So we really hope you can come and take a look yeah. at that and you know, we can get some investments going. Of course, with MDB concessional so, financing to launch it. Stephanie, Thank we you. have the promise of the G fans and others committed to funding projects, especially in the net zero. We have the pipeline of projects. So in addition to capacity development, you mentioned the ecosystem. What could be uh, making you more interested in checking this pipeline? I would say I would agree with Vera. Bring the investors in early so that all parts of the system Closer. can... Closer. Closer to the microphone, please. So that all parts of the system really understand each other's objectives and requirements and constraints. So bring in the project developers, the investors, the DFI, the MDB, to, to have a fuller discussion. Very good. Uh, Professor, next turn. You taught us about how to link macro to micro, short term to long term. Pipeline lengths of projects to your report. I, I want to leave you with one number, which is in large measure an answer to that question. All strands in these arguments, investment climate, project pipeline, low cost finance, uh, take you to the multilateral development banks. So the one number I want to leave you with is that if this whole story is going to work, and it's a story of the investments necessary to deliver on Paris, we have to triple, triple the lending capacity of the MDBs, the financing capacity of the MDBs within the next five years. If it's to be able to participate in all those ways, pipelines, policies, de-risking fundamentally with the private sector, helping with the right. concessional capital, that is absolutely crucial. We've talked about 2030. We have to triple the financing capacity of those institutions in the next five years. It's perfectly possible, and it costs very little. Right, and for that, you need an ultimate connector between the global initiatives and the local response. Achim Steiner. I think we are, in many ways, all aligned. I think perhaps from UNDP's perspective, the focus still remains, how do we help those who traditionally will not be in the first, the second, or the third row when it comes to accessing finance? And I think even with the MDBs, um, Nick, we have to come back to two things, the terms on which this finance becomes available, whether we look at the complexities that are being created around the Green Climate Fund, the Global Environment Facility, these are not mechanisms that are easily accessible to many countries. Um, equally, we need to look at the terms of financing. For the private sector to invest, we have to look at how markets can actually be adjusted or influenced in a way that is not prohibitive for those countries that normally would not access capital. Once we tackle those issues, it is the MDBs, but it's also the private investor. It is domestic capital that very often might look for a way to put their money outside the country yes. that would actually invest in the country. That's the frontier of, of the work that I think we have to focus on. Thank Excellent. You. Ambassador Wallenberg, you have the last word. Well, yes, not, not necessarily the last word, but a few thoughts. Uh, uh, we mentioned Close MDBs. To the we mentioned MDBs, and there's no, no question that it need, they need to evolve and move in the right direction. This isn't just from this panel. We've heard high officials from developed countries, but it is a responsibility. All of us should remember these MDBs have stakeholders, and the stakeholders are, have much influence, and they need to come in and not just say it in public fora, but actually influence that change. Number two, regarding public money, it will continue to be, remain center, central. No one is under the illusion that the 100 billion or other available public finance is going to resolve the issue, but it does go a long way in providing trust and assurance. The 100 billion dollars is a, is, is a drop in an ocean of needs, but it is an important starting point. We saw 
commitment yesterday from the Prime Minister of the UK, for example. We're all talking about doubling of adaptation finance compared to 2019 levels to 2025. By simply making the commitment that the United Kingdom would triple, not double, voluntarily, that sends a very important political message to other developed countries that they need to step up their game, but also to developing countries that no one will be left behind. There will be seed money coming from the developing, developed countries to help in this regard. So it is essential to remember that as, as we move forward, that there is a significance and a political sense of trust that comes when developed countries deliver on their obligations. The last figure is very important. As Akim said, we all know the figure according to the IMF that came up for COVID, which is an emergency, was $9 trillion. Yeah. That is the money that is posted yeah. on the website. This is an equally but long-term catas catastrophic emergency that we are contending with. And our figures should not be modest and our aspirations for the availability of finance, because as I said, it is the sine qua non. Without it, all the transformations we're talking about on adaptation, on mitigation, on everything, will simply not happen. There will be talk without money being there to back them. Excellent. You are great panelists. You provided great knowledge to all of us with practical emphasis on all of the points. Um, for, to the organizers, we started 25 minutes late. I saved 12, uh, 12 minutes, so you owe me some credit somewhere. Thank you so much. Please join me in thanking this great panel. Thank you so much.